Welcome to the world of mathematics, where the work of one PhD student over a century ago still influences everything from quantum mechanics to machine learning today. In this video, we're exploring part of the fascinating work of Maurice Frechet and his groundbreaking theory that changed the course of mathematics forever. So sit down, grab pen and paper, and prepare to dive into his quest to generalize the work of Weierstrass on continuous functions of a real variable. Weierstrass proved that for a closed bounded interval, continuous functions are guaranteed to take a maximum value. But closed and bounded can mean different things depending on the metric. For Shane needed to find a more fundamental property that gives this result about continuous functions in more general settings. That's what led him to the invention of a compact set. For anyone that has studied analysis, it quickly becomes clear how fundamental and important compact sets are. They are fundamental to a lot of really cool mathematics, such as fractals, which leverage what is called the Hausdorff metric on compact sets, in which we'll talk about more when we get to continuous functions. It's also really fundamental to functional analysis in general, where the base level space that you study is the space of continuous functions over a compact set, which allows you to define a norm on them. But first, before we can do all of that fun stuff, we need to talk about what compact sets even are. Now, how do we think of compact sets generally? Usually we think of them as just a closed and bounded set. Uh, this is complete characterization in Rn using the Euclidean norm. This is the heine borel theorem, which we will prove at the end of this video. And as a cartoon version of compact sets, it's handy to think that way. Compact sets are always closed and bounded, but you can have metric spaces where the implication doesn't go the other way around. Okay, but I haven't even told you what it means to be compact yet. But since AI is so popular today, why don't we just go ahead and see what ChatGPT tells us about compact sets. So I get such a kick asking ChatGPT to answer questions. Uh, we've seen earlier in another video that it can't do things like prove basic theorems. I just enjoy going through here and asking it simple things. I'm making a whole video of how bad ChatGPT is at math other than what I asked it before. But let, let's go ahead and see what this one has to say. So how would you describe compact sets, ChatGPT? In mathematics, a set is considered compact if it is closed, meaning it contains all of its limit points, and bounded, meaning that all of its elements are located within a finite distance of some fixed point, such as the origin. Okay, that's not horrible. I mean, it's not right. I mean, it is at least the definition that we would use in the reals. In the reals, every closed and bounded set is compact. So, all right, we'll, we'll give that to ChatGPT. Intuitively, compact sets can be thought of as sets that are both small and complete in some sense. They are small in the sense that they do not have any points that are arbitrarily far away from the rest of the set, and they are complete in the sense that they contain all of their limit points. Okay, that's not really what we mean by complete in metric space theory. In metric space theory, we mean that if we take a Cauchy sequence, that that Cauchy sequence is gonna have a limiting value. It does turn out that compact sets are complete, so it's not terrible there. Compact sets are fundamental concepts in analysis and topology, and they have many useful properties. For example, any continuous function defined on a compact set is bounded and attains its maximum and minimum values on that set. Absolutely true. Additionally, many important theorems in analysis and topology, such as the heine borel theorem and the bolzano weierstrass theorem, are based on the concept of compactness. Also true. So that's good. We're actually going to talk about the heine borel theorem in a minute. Then ChatGPT. Are there closed and bounded sets that are not compact? Yes, there are closed and bounded sets in certain spaces that are not compact. Yes, that is true, actually. Um, you, you can do this with the discrete metric, for instance. I'm, I'm sure it's going to talk about that. In fact, the existence of such uh, sets is a fundamental result in topology, and it distinguishes spaces that are, quote, nice from those that are more complicated. All right, that's completely subjective, we'll see. One example of a closed and bounded set that is not compact is a set of real numbers on the interval is zero to one with an open on the one. With an open on the one, what? No, that, that's not, yeah, it's not compact, but it's also not closed. Consider it as a subset of the reals with the usual topology. It, this set is closed because it contains all of its limit points, in this case, the point one. It, it is defined not to include one. So there is truth in that sentence, but there's a lot of falsehoods too. And in fact, ChatGPT contradicts itself in that same paragraph. I'm just gonna stop here because I, I, I'm not sure it's actually gonna get any better and uh, I kind of want to get back to the video. Okay, so now let's talk about the actual definition. A compact set is a set where if you can cover it with a collection of open sets, we call this an open cover, then it turns out you can also cover that compact set with a finite number of those same open sets. We call this a finite subcover. Let me give you a first example of a compact set. 
finite sets. This is fairly straightforward to show. If you have an open covering of a finite number of points, then each of those points has to be within at least one of those open sets. So take one set for each point, and ta-da, that's a finite subcover. Piece of cake. So we have existence at least, but we would kind of like a new definition to cover more than just finite sets, because why would we bother saying, this is a compact set, let's give a crazy definition and really just characterize just finite sets. I'm going to walk you through how Baby Rudin goes about uh, presenting this. He actually starts the same way. What I find amusing is that until the very end of this section, Rudin doesn't actually tell you that a compact set can be anything more interesting than a finite set. It's like the very end of that section. If I was developing a theory based on such an abstract notion as an open cover, by the time I proved the third or fourth theorem in here, I'd really start worrying that I was proving a whole lot of stuff about finite sets, which is really alarming. But what is really cool is that the second he gives us our first non-trivial compact set, the theory instantly shows you that compact sets are a very rich collection of objects, and practically every set you've imagined is either a compact set or just a closure away from one. But before we get into it, if you've liked this video so far, then please take a moment, hit that like button, and you know, also subscribe. Right now, we are in the middle of a series giving a thorough treatment of real analysis, mostly from the baby Rudin perspective. But there's a ton of fun mathy things on the channel if you want to go browsing around. I even ate peppers while doing arithmetic in an older video. It was for charity. Okay. So let's break down Rudin's list of theorems on compact sets. This theorem here connects compact sets with the topology we've been developing. Here we are saying that every compact set is closed, which is another way of saying it has all of its limit points. The proof is pretty clever. We take a point P outside the compact set, and then for any point in the compact set, we take two open sets, one for that point outside and one for the point inside. And, and we do this in such a way that the neighborhoods are actually disjoint from each other. And the way we get that is we just make sure that each of their neighborhoods are have a radius less than half of the distance between the two of them. And this is very much a topology style proof. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take all those neighborhoods, those Q that we've peppered all over that compact set. And well, we know that that union of those neighborhoods for each of those Qs in the compact set is the entire compact set because at the very least, each point is in its own neighborhood. But we know since it's a compact set, we only need a finite number of them. So we can now get a covering of our compact set with a finite number of these neighborhoods. Uh, by the way, this is also how you show that compact sets are bounded. But what we have is we also have those corresponding neighborhoods around our outside point P. And since there's only a finite number of neighborhoods covering our compact set, we can actually shrink that point P down to the smallest of those neighborhoods, and that's still going to be disjoint from the rest of that union. Well, if it's disjoint from that union, then that means it's disjoint from our compact set, which means that it can't be a limit point of a compact set, and so therefore the complement is open and the compact set is closed. So that's pretty nice. Something really interesting here is that this whole proof works in more general topologies, specifically Hausdorff topologies, which guarantee that for any two distinct points you can find two disjoint open sets containing them. Those open sets play the role of neighborhoods here, and the rest of the proof just goes straight through. So, Compact sets are closed. That's great, but we still don't know if there's anything that aren't finite. The next theorem says that closed subsets of compact sets are compact. Okay, so if we do find a non-trivial compact set, we can get a bunch more by looking at closed subsets of that set. But before we can really leverage that, we really want to know that there is at least one non-finite compact set. The first non-trivial compact set that we're introduced to is that of a closed interval, which is nice because that corresponds to what Weierstrass was working on in the 19th century. Well, really, much more generally, we get an n-dimensional rectangular prism is a compact set uh, with what he calls an n-cell or a k-cell, depending on what you want to label your dimensions by. These rectangular prisms are essentially just Cartesian products of closed intervals. Uh, later on, you have uh, Tikhonov's theorem out of general topology that tells you that every Cartesian product of compact sets stays compact. This is just a sort of small version of that. Now, this might seem innocuous, but this simple set being compact really wins the day, and it lets us prove the heine borel theorem. The heine borel theorem says that in Euclidean space, every closed and bounded set is compact. Using what we know, this is really, really easy to show. A bounded set can be enclosed by an n-dimensional rectangular prism. Well, that prism is compact, and closeness tells us that our first set is compact, uh, since now we have demonstrated that any closed subset of a compact set is compact. And 
that part's done. Now the other direction works for any metric space. We already know compact sets are closed, and boundedness just comes from covering the compact sets with a neighborhood at each and every point. And then by compactness, we only need to find a number of them. Uh, and then the compact set is covered by a finite collection of these bounded sets, which means that it's bounded. What is truly remarkable about the honey Braille theorem is that it basically took us from knowing only finite sets are compact to almost every set you encounter in the reals is a closure away from being a compact set, uh, provided, you know, of course, that it's bounded. So before you guys leave, I want you to know that Frechet's definition of compactness is actually different than what we're talking about. So what Frechet said was that K is compact if every nested sequence of subsets of K has at least one point in common. So basically, if we had Kn, all subsets of k, and we have that kn contains kn plus 1. We have that the intersection over n going from 1 to infinity of kn is not empty. So then that, that's his definition of compactness. This is actually a, a consequence of this theorem in Rudin, which is called the finite intersection property. We can talk about that later. I don't want to make this video too long. In any case, I hope you enjoyed this video. It's part of a series I've been doing on real analysis. If you found it helpful, then please, you know, like and subscribe, all that usual stuff. It, it really does help me. Thank you for watching, and I hope you have a great day.